I'm now delighted to introduce um, Professor Cathy Humphreys. Um, a number of you will be aware that um, Cathy has worked as a social work practitioner in the mental health, the domestic violence, the child, youth and family sector for a number of years before becoming a social work academic. She worked previously at the University of Warwick in the UK. And for five years, Cathy held the Alfred Felton Chair of Child and Family Welfare, a professorship established in collaboration with the Alfred Felton Trust um, in the Department of Social Work at the University of Melbourne. Um, Cathy's going to speak to us about the Patricia Project, and this is about the ones around pathways and research in collaborative interagency working. Um, I'm really delighted to be facilitating this session. I'm a family lawyer by trade who practised in domestic violence and am now responsible also for child protection policy. So for me, this is the absolute triangle of interface. How do we actually get the family law, the child protection and the domestic violence models to talk to each other in a meaningful way? Way. I'm delighted to introduce P Professor Cathy Humphreys. What a good question, Cathy. <laughs> Therein lies our challenge. So let me begin by um, acknowledging um, the Wurundjeri people um, of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to elders past and present and elders here today. So as Cathy said, um, my job is to talk with you about the Patricia Project. Um, Patricia is a pretty loose acronym for Pathways and Research in Collaborative Interagency Working, which you can tell is a bit of a mouthful, and Patricia seems a nice little shorthand, not to be confused with another loose ac acronym, the MAVE Project, which is the co-directed um, work that I do with Kelsey Hedegarty um, called the Melbourne Research Alliance to End Violence Against Women and Their Children. And this is part of the research hub that we're um, creating at University of Melbourne, but also including other universities and um, other researchers in this area of violence against women and their children. It's a great little motive, isn't it, from um, Gav Barbie, who has some other branding that he has generously shared with us, um, which I think is a nice representation of the notion of sort of hubs with their connections and disconnections. So just going back to this notion of um, this presentation, we've been very, given very strict instructions, 25 minutes, which actually for me was a little bit of a challenge because actually the Patricia Project has got six different strands of research which means, you know, four minutes for each strand, and we haven't got any results yet, other than in the literature review. Now, it's really hard, can I just say, to make a literature review really interesting, early in the morning or after lunch or any time, for 45 minutes. So, basically then, we've just sort of stepped back to think, and I thought about the challenge that Heather sent, um, gave to us yesterday about thinking about the issues that Anne Rose has really tried to work with about saying this is applied research that we want to see make a difference. And so I thought I might, through this little description of the Patricia Project, talk about some of the issues around um, what we're learning about the parallel processes of collaboration in research, which are a reflection of the collaborative processes in interagency working. What is it that we're learning as we go? So I'm just going to, I'm not, you know, did you see how Peter just stopped at 25 minutes? Bang. It was so impressive. Mine's not going to be like that, okay? I'm just going to stop at 25 minutes, wherever I'm up to, and then we'll just go into some questions, because actually answering questions is much more interesting than pre presenting. So it just seems to me that there's a lot of time for questions, and let's take that time. And I'm going to, I've got some slides here. I'm just going to skip over them, and if you want me to come back to them in the question time, then I can do that. So we're a multi-organisational team. We've got Lucy Healy, who's our, um, our linchpin of the project. Where's Lucy? Do you want us to stand up, Lucy? Where? Lucy. There she is, right at the very back. Okay, Lucy's the linchpin of the project. It would be chaos without her. Um, so, you know, she's been a great person to bring together what I can only really refer to as a sort of, a, I think, a gaggle of professors. So myself, Marie Connolly, Aaron Shlonsky, Elaine Katz, Donna Chung, Patrick O'Leary, Sarah Went, 
and senior academics Menka Sanfeski, Leslie Lang, Susan Hewitt Bell, Fiona Buchanan. So, okay, we're stretched across five states of Australia, and within each state, we've got a senior um, academic and investigator and a researcher that works with them. And then our partners in government and the community sector organisations. Okay, so we're actually a massive uh, collaboration, really. And we also have a strand of the research that works with David Mandel, who has been very influential in the US, in Scotland, and now in Australia, looking at how um, child protection can shift its practice to be more aligned with the needs of um, domestic violence. Because basically the child protection system was never set up to deal with children living with domestic violence. And so there are a lot of challenges which are systemic and not about individual workers. And I guess that's why we've got an advisory group um, which works alongside us through the project, which is full of um, representatives from each um, State Department of Child Protection, as well as someone from Women's Legal Services and someone from the... Um, and from NGOs in the sector. So, and quite a number of those people are in this audience today. So our overarching question, are what, is the, what are the elements that facilitate differential pathways, appropriate service system support for the safety and wellbeing of women and children living with and separating from family violence in an integrated intervention system? But our focus is really what Cathy said, which is, what is it about the collaborative practice in interagency working between child protection, specialist domestic and family violence services, and family law. How do you make that very difficult nexus work? So, Anna Bly put it out yesterday. Tell a story. Okay, so here's my story. That actually, which illustrates, I think, why we're doing the Patricia Project and why ANROS funded us to get the Patricia Project. So, you know, there's been a contentious history in this area, but there's also opportunities for good practice. So let me tell you the story, you know, that was just raised with me just even last week by a domestic violence ad advocate who will remain nameless. I'd love to identify her but because she does such a fabulous job. But it would identify the area, and I think that wouldn't be helpful for her or for anyone else. So it's a recent story. Um, she was talking about her organisation, which was a, is a family violence um, organisation, Specialist Family Violence Services, getting the facts back from the police about a, about a domestic violence incident that they attended. Written on the L17 was the fact that it was a serious incident of domestic violence, but the woman had left and the children were still at home with the perpetrator. The man, they said, was um, very um, amenable to the fact that the woman could... He was very welcoming about the woman. Can, she knows that she can come home, that she can live here with the children as long as she lives in the bathroom and doesn't have a mobile phone. He went, what? Can you say that again? That was written on the L17. And they said that, you know, they thought that this was potentially that the woman was high, that it was a high risk, potentially a high risk situation, but the woman was also problematic. And so the domestic violence worker went to child protection and said, you know, what's going on here? And they agreed with the police that the woman was a bit problematic and kept on leaving the children. Now, you can imagine that when the advocate talks to the woman, there's a slightly different story. You know, she has to return to the house because that's where the children are, and she leaves when he threatens her or when she breaks the rules of leaving the bathroom, he becomes violent and abusive. So then the advocate works closely with child protection, who once they start to challenge the man, see, in fact, how dangerous he is because he becomes very, not very reasonable, extremely threatening, once challenged, and now, you know, these women are living at an anonymous address elsewhere in Victoria with her, she's living with the children and the offender is elsewhere. 
And I guess that was one of several incidents of very poor practice that this advocate was seeing between the police and child protection. And that, you know, that wasn't an area of work that was very well developed at all. So instead of going apoplectic, as some of us might have done, because she's very experienced at change processes in this area of domestic violence and has been doing it for 20 years in different parts of the state, um, she then worked to develop new agreements with the child protection team, where now when there's a domestic violence incident, where there's domestic violence in the incident that child protection's going out to in terms of visiting a family, she, the, the advocates are called and they do it as a joint visit. And now after six months of doing this, they're seeing really quite dramatic changes in practice and in outcomes for women and children that actually what they're seeing is there's not, these are a lot of very high risk women and their children and the child protection workers are saying these women are the ones that churn through the system, they're not churning through the system. And that the numbers of children coming in out of home care in these families has now been um, stopped. So that's an example, that's the story. Okay, that's why the Patricia Project is here. It is about saying actually there's a lot of practice that's very inadequate in this space, but there are opportunities for change. So how are we developing? So that's Anna Bly's next thing was, it's story plus evidence. How are we collecting the evidence? Okay, so this is a complicated project. Can you see that? It's complicated. I'll, I'll, explain, the, I'll, I'll explain the different parts of it. So there's an action research process. So that what we're trying to do is, you know, at, we've got a very good reference group as I was saying, and it goes, works um, at different points, meets through the different parts of the project, and is also kept in touch with through the other parts of um, the different elements. So we really work with this notion of thinking about what are the changes in practices that are occurring as our changes in understanding occur. So that's the action research project is the process, isn't it? A situation and you're trying to modify it. That's what that advocate was doing. What's the situation? What's the identified problem? Can we make a change? So there's a lot of good reasons for having an action research project designed into a research program so that you get the learning as you go. And that when it comes to knowledge exchange, you're not trying to build that in at the end. You've tried to bring it, build it in with your partners at the beginning so they own the project and they own the results of the project as you go. So that when we're thinking about um, the Gautier, I think that that's um, who Heather was talking about, thinking about what's the content, what's the influence, and how do you get the impact of evidence? And so if you build in your partners into the actual dynamic of the project and its research design, you're feeding back results as you go, then you've got a better chance of that pickup. Doesn't always work, but you know, there's a chance, you've got a better chance of the pickup. So, what else have we got? The scoping review, um, which is our literature review, and that's out there now. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. There's the Pathways Project. So, the, the um, scoping review was led by um, the Parenting Research Centre. Um, the Pathways Project, um, which is led by um, Aaron Schlonsky and his team. Um, now, that looks at, this is our high level stuff, this is our quant bit, which is what are our big databases in New South Wales, Victoria and Western Australia saying about the trajectory of families where there's identified family violence through the child protection system. So that's looking at that big picture stuff and then we're looking at, well, then we're looking at issues around perpetrator accountability, looking at, well, what are the guidance, what's got, what guidance and legislation is guiding practice in this area? And then looking at a case reading process with David Mandel's materials. That's about the micro practices. So Aaron's work with his team is all about the big picture. Case reading is about what are we actually doing that's being documented in child protection files which could tell us something about practice and how we might learn from practice and changes and shifts in practice in this area. And then there are five case studies 
in each of five states to look at where have we got innovative practice and how can we make a difference. So we haven't gone for the bad story. So I've I've started with a bad story, but what we're looking for in the case studies is the good stories. What is it that we're doing that's making a difference and how might some of that be generalisable or transferable in terms of either what we understand about collaborative practice or um, the specifics of how you get that interface between child protection, family law and specialist family violence services. Okay, so let me just spend a moment on the scoping review because even though I know it's not the most dynamic part of any research project, it's absolutely foundational. And so just to mention that there is a state of knowledge paper as well as a briefing paper done by the Parenting Research Centre in which they did a very careful analysis, you know, with Lucy and me, um, so there's a team, of 24 different models of interagency working which were reviewed. Um, And that's available, of course, on the wonderful Anne Rose website. There's the team. We do collaboration, can I just say? We do collaboration in a big way. You can see there's a big team there. But really, Michelle um, McVeigh, where's Michelle? Somewhere there. There she is. Michelle did a great job working over time intensively to get this um, reported to Anne Rose and, um, and completed. And... The question that guided the research, what processes or practices do child protection services and specialist domestic violence services or family law engage in so they can work better together to improve service responses for women and children living with and separating from family violence? That was a research question. And after the massive search, 24 models were looked at. And about um, nine of those were Australian models. Not all of them were all about child protection, but they had to have some element in them around child protection. Um, So we looked across those um, different models as they were written up and as they were evaluated. So we didn't look at ones that had no evaluation aspect to them. And I guess... What was the finding? Well, actually, that there's very little definitive data about, you know, what's the way forward, but there are some directions that you might look at. And I guess one of the things that's really helpful about doing the literature review is having those foundational concepts. So we'll be using these concepts about the different ways in which you think about interagency practice as a way of then thinking about our case studies and the other aspects that you should be looking at if you're trying to look at how organisations do a collaborative interface together. And what are the specific ways in thinking about child protection that might be useful and that in those 24 different studies, these were some of the things that were being used. Development of formal agreements and working together and sharing information. Actually, in the statutory sector, you've got to have those protocols because they're not allowed to share information without them. So, you know, having those protocols is going to, if you're going to look at any interface, then they've got to be there. Use of operational manuals, having some consistency in practice, sharing theoretical frameworks, goals and visions. Okay, that's a huge challenge in this area because we know that in the family law area, in the, um, in the specialist family violence services, whether they're men's services or women's services, And in the child protection area, they've got different histories, different traditions, and a different focus. So that, you know, that particular, you know, number three there is really um, important. Co-location, shared data management, that's a a tricky one, formation of committees and meetings, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see there's a range of different, you know, in fact, there's a multitude of practices that lay behind those 24 different ways of working, but it has to be said that none of them were really fully evaluated to go, is this making a difference or not? And um, so that we've got directions rather than findings about 
what to do. I guess it identified the many different challenges in the interface of child protection working in the domestic violence arena. And I would say that you know, there are some very specific challenges in child protection work. And so let me just sort of name one of them to start off with and think about what are we trying to do about that. So one of them is developing a differential response. Okay? One of the biggest mistakes we've made in our whole policy agenda in this area around children living with domestic violence has been mandatory reporting. Okay? All we've done is inundate the child protection system Actually, at least a third of children, in any, in any study of children living with domestic violence, there's always a third that are doing as well as anyone else in the, any other children in the community. Actually, they do not belong in the child protection system. So that you might want to give them a service. Of course they need a service because living with domestic violence is it's a human right for children not to live with violence and abuse. But actually, they're not up there in the tertiary end of the system. And it's also unethical to respond to women seeking help in emergency. They are not making a referral to child protection. When they ring the police and go, help, that's not a referral to child protection that they're making. And for us to interpret that as a, a referral to child protection is actually an unethical thing to be doing and creates this massive distortion in practice. So how we develop a differential response, because of course children die. There is a need for a group of children to be in statutory child protection, undergoing an investigation, substantiation and really looking at the harm. The differential response is part of the Pathways team. So they're looking at, well, what is happening across our different states in terms of trying to develop a differential response. Now, can I just say, I've got no findings here. <laughs> but they're coming, they're coming. But we are looking at trying to understand how the child protection system intervenes with families where there's domestic and family violence, um, particularly identified in the initial report. And this is the extraordinary thing. Three data sets of de-identified unit record data from New South Wales, Victoria, and Western Australia has been delivered to the Pathways team to analyze and to look at patterns um, across those data sets. Now, that's an extraordinary collaborative achievement. And, you know, we've been working for years on that. And, you know, in some states it's much easier to do than others, but actually to be able to give that sort of data, even though, you know, even de-identified data, which it is, um, doesn't happen easily. And so, you know, what they're looking at is what's the description, what's the pattern, what's the movement through um, the, the child protection system for families and children living with domestic violence? And then... The analysis, too, is the effects of the triage on the system. So that's that differential response because it is really different. It is interesting to see that across different states there is a number of different innovations, but in each of those states there, are different, there will be problems that arise at different points in that child protection trajectory for children living with domestic violence. So then in New South Wales you know, we're after the Woods Inquiry. They introduced a number of innovations, one of which was to divert um, children which don't meet the statutory threshold of risk of harm, of significant harm, out of the system towards a, a different service provision. And so they developed the Child Wellbeing Unit and the Mandatory Reporters Guide. And then in Western Australia, you've got a different thing, but also a differential response happening. So they've introduced their, their family and domestic violence response teams, which again are part of a triage process. In Victoria, we haven't developed that differential response, um, though we have developed, we've had, had a bigger development of the service system for domestic and family violence in the community sector. And who knows what the Royal Commission will recommend in this space. So I think what we could say is that's all a work in progress. 
So all this stuff will come out later. I think that one of the things is there's been an issue in terms of the process which says a lot about what are the collaborative processes and what were the characteristics that made it possible for that level of collaboration to occur. And you could also say that about the parallel process in relation to research and practice in other elements of our um, Patricia project, which have made us reflect at the halfway point on the nature of collaboration, because that's what this is about. How do we understand the characteristics of collaboration and what, it make, what makes it work to get over the barriers? What facilitates collaboration? What gets in the way? And so, you know, the case reading process, again, this is a highly sensitive process where you manage to get five state child protection part departments to engage in the case reading of, of files between, and the case reading team from each state included not just child protection but someone from a specialist family violence sector and a researcher. So these are ways in which child protection de-identifies de some cases. David Mandel trains our teams to look at how do you read these files so you can look at how in the documented file is their child safety being attended to? Is, the, is there an alliance being made with the mother and child in that relationship? Or, you know, particularly the non-offending parent, but usually the mother. And is, is practice pivoting to focus on the perpetrator? Of the domestic violence of and of the domestic violence. So the case reading practice is really about challenge number two, which is how do you pivot the intervention in child protection from focusing everything on the mother and is she a protective parent or not, to looking at an intervention with the perpetrator. Now, if I had my one sharp spear, okay, if I had my one sharp, that's the other bit of Alan Byron. Was it Anna who said about the one sharp spear? Okay. This is the one I'd go for. If you could change this in child protection work, you would change everything. Okay, now there are other challenges, like the differential response, but if you can change this so that it occurs in a better way, then you will change child protection practice in this space, and that will make a difference to the interface with all the other systems. Because the case reading process is about What's the quality of screening for domestic and family violence in the child protection space? What is the quality of the domestic violence practices in cases where it's identified? And it's all about going, it's not about the individual, it's not an audit of an individual's work, it's about what are the themes, trends and practices that we can learn from to change practice. So I thought to get five states, five teams, redacted files, you know, which is actually a big process in itself. Some of those files were 2,000 pages long. How do you get that to happen? Made us reflect on the issues around collaboration. And I have to say, there isn't one sharp spear there. All right, you can see. <laughs> you won't be able to read all that. This is Getty's work about thinking about um, so he's from the UK and thinking about what are the complex issues, complex issues that make a collaborative partnership work. And he talks about virtuous circles, so some of you will have heard all this, ambitious circles. And I have to say that when Lucy Healy and I were working on the SAFER project, looking at regional committees and how they were collaborating and working together, we were really, you know, we had quant data and we were trying to understand was there a silver bullet around collaborative practice? And actually, you know, was it having a good facilitator, the good RIC, um, was there, which was the regional coordinator position, was it whether they were rural or whether they were city, was it, you know, that you had experienced workers, was it that, you know, the gender balance, what, what was it? Actually, there was no silver ballot, bullet. All you could say was out of the eight regional areas, those that were doing well were clearly in a virtuous circle where lots of good things were happening and those that were doing badly, lots of bad things were happening. 
and you've got to try and get yourself into a virtuous circle. And it seems to me that when we're thinking about the Patricia Project, that we are sort of making a reflection on trying to set up the collaborative process in the research team that then also flows through in the design to make it a collaboration that helps to facilitate change in the, um, with our partners. And so thinking about the collaboration, what was it in our collaboration? I think that, you know, amongst that gaggle of professors and senior, senior academics, there's a lot of, um, the, it's a strong and stable leadership. You cannot do action research where you've got a lot of churn. And so, you know, some of us have been around, I hate to say, for, for a very long time, as well as we've got some younger people in there as well. So strong and stable leadership does seem to be one of these things that's named in the virtuous circle. Clearly defined roles in, uh, in research. So, you know, clearly defined roles. We've got six different, pro six different strands and it's pretty clear what you have to do in each strand. Enough resource, sort of. We've had to capacity build a little bit of, of Lucy's job <laughs> to make it possible. But, you know, certainly Anne Rose and the funding from Anne Rose made this process possible. And I guess there's enthusiasm, enthusiasm and commitment to the area of work from the research team and it's a reciprocated practice. And I guess there's also been a shared history of working together. So all of us in that big collaborative research team, so, you know, we haven't all worked together all the time, but we've had a history between us of working collaboratively and enthusiastically and committed to this space. So then it's about thinking about, well, what are the collaborative processes? And I guess we are making this more of a part of the project, but just sort of some heads up. What are the things about that are clear from the Patricia Project so far? Senior leadership in each jurisdiction supported participation in the Patricia Project. That is so important when you're working in bureaucracy and clearly made a difference. And there was an interesting point made by one of the senior practitioners who said, you've got to know who to talk to, but you're also going to have to know who not to talk to. Because <laughs> it's pretty easy to get into a vicious circle. It's very easy for collaboration to be destroyed. And it's very sort of difficult to make it all come together. And it's about how you get all these ducks lined up. And that seems to be the key to a collaborative process that you've the, there's a context supportive of senior leadership, there were champions, and they were supported by the context. The COAG agenda names domestic violence as one of their priorities. Domestic and family violence intervention is a clear priority for, for reform across all the different states. There's a lot of criticism of child protection practice to up its, to up its game in this area. There's access to high quality resources through David Mandel and all his online um, all his online resources and his very good conceptualisation of what needs to change in child protection practice and how you get there. And, you know, David Mandel was a key carrot for our child protection partners to come into the project, I'm sure. And engagement in the end, there's, there's a notion of, okay, we're not going to be attacked, we're going to be building this together. We're going to be part of the research and collaborating in the research. There's constructive competition between states, enthusiastic frontline workers, and some honorarians. It's not often that you actually give money to government departments from a research project, but we're going, actually, it's going to cost them to, do, to redact those files and to put workers on the job. So we gave them some money out of the Patricia Project to support the collaborative effort and to recognise that there was actually work that was, they were doing. And just finally, so that's just a little reflection on the fact that actually when you're in a collaborative, when your research project is about collaboration, that having some reflection on your own collaborative processes is really important. Now that's my view of it, and someone else on the front line might be going, oh my God, but she doesn't know the whole story. <laughs> There are many different stories about the collaboration in the Patricia Project. But overall, I think that, you know, there's been some delivery on some very difficult agendas. And then we have the case study sites. And again, that requires a lot of collaboration between child protection, family law, and specialist family violence services to really have researchers go in to talk with them 
about the particular aspects of collaboration in that team. And they'll be addressing some of the other challenges that are out there for child protection, which was never a system designed to deal with domestic violence. So we've talked about the differential response, the focus on the perpetrator, but there are other issues as well. The fact is you've got two victims. Now, child protection really only deals with a child victim. And trying to shift the focus to recognise that, in fact, you've got two victims, so it's not just about the child, not just about the adult victim being usually a mother, but she also has some needs that need to be addressed. Dealing with complex interlo inter interlocking problems. So often when you've got mental health and alcohol and drug, the domestic violence falls into the background. How do you shift that? And then there's this notion of, we'll take the children unless you separate. You know, it's that old mantra. If you ask workers, they go, no, we don't do it anymore. If you ask, you know, if you ask, but actually it's a very pervasive part of practice and it's a great fear from women accessing the system. And we do know that enforced statutory separations don't work and there's issues around post-separation violence that are absolutely critical in this space. Recognition of domestic violence as an attack on the mother-child relationship and the issues around risk assessment because without good risk assessments, then it's very difficult to work out how you're going to do a consistent differential response. So, just in short, there's a whole range of amaze, in fact, of differing philosophies, eligibility criteria, knowledge bases, service types, funding contracts, ethical issues, legal considerations. Actually, it is rocket science to try and bring these different parts of the service system together. Claire Tilbury was really, I think, right on the money there, where she says how difficult the process is and how important it is to try and spend the time to facilitate um, the work to try and make a difference in this space, because it will make a difference to the lives of women and their children who are living with domestic violence. And there's my... You'll see a lot of that slide. We all have to put it up there. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy. And, and as you could see, um, Kathy could have quite happily gone for Give another, another half hour. I was, gonna, I was gonna say another hour. <laughs> So fantastic. Um, I want to apologise to the organisers. Um, I got instructions. We were meant to sit on chairs. Of course, I happily ignored those in the first instance because I really can't see beyond about the second table. So my apologies. It was meant to be a much more interactive, engaging, discussion-like approach. And poor Heather had to say to me, Cathy. And I went, oh, dear. <laughs> um, we've got uh, two microphones. Cathy and I are going to get out from behind the podium, but we're also going to open it up. We won't necessarily sit down. Um, but we, that way I can actually see people instead of looking at somewhere else and there someone's over here. And I can already see a hand up the back. So um, really keen to understand. I think Cathy's actually taken us further and started to get us thinking about what are some of the policy practices, knowledge and understanding challenges that are coming forward. Hello, my name's Judy Parton. I just wanted to say thank you, Cathy. I'm in awe of the uh, scale and the ambition of your project. Um, I think it's just tremendous you're tackling such a complex and difficult subject area. My question was actually quite technical. It was more around the sampling of the files. The, the how sampling, that's, sorry, Judy, the sampling, sampling of, of the case files, how you're going to get what might be a representative sample of files. I mean, you talked about how David Mandel's guiding the analysis, but the actual sampling I would have thought was quite crucial. Okay, so Lucy can probably speak in more detail about this because that's been a, you know, a veritable minefield. We've had, you know, we had a very clear tree, okay? So there's a point in time, so there was a process that was done by every state by a senior practitioner or a senior person, senior manager, um, and at a particular point in time, they took the first 20 files. 20 files, Lucy, or 100? 100. 100. They took the first 100 files. They took the first 100 files, and then they divide them into those where, child, where domestic violence was named in the initial and where it wasn't named but was there. Okay? Because, in fact, most of the cases have some domestic violence in them, but it's not necessarily the, the issue that's named up front. 
And then, so there was that division, and then there was a series of criteria which made it an important file. So it was a stratified sampling, where we go, is this, 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 and this in that space so that we can, it would be an interesting and useful learning file. And so then it got down to four files. One which was brought as a redacted file to the training workshop and then there's case reading workshops over two day periods that are happening in each state following the training. Because it's a way of getting those senior practitioners really thinking about the fact that they want to make a change to practice and this gives them one of the tools that help to make that change because there's nothing like it. Other questions, comments? Yep. Hello, uh, Megan Hughes from South Australia. Thank you, Cathy. That was really um, fantastic to hear that work. Um, I think there is quite a lot of uh, groups now forming uh, in the different states, including ours. We've got a, a, an alliance um, of a large group of NGOs that are really keen to develop this work called Australian Children's Safety Alliance using David Mandel's work. Um, and I, one of my reflections is firstly, how do we connect those dots? Um, that, you know, because Patricia was quite knew we hadn't heard of that before and when we did we were thrilled about how this is uh, this work is happening and is really going to inform but um, inform our own work in South Australia but I'm also too wondering about just the challenges of collaborative work uh, to to really make inroads here and part of my reflection is maybe it's about that really the people that are getting together on this work all work in the tertiary space. There's very little work being done in a preventative space where people have got more time to think about and uh, to really change the systems. I mean, I think it is interesting. The David Mandel stuff is really very much identified with the tertiary end. And it's saying we do have to do something better at the tertiary end. I think in terms of how do we take it forward, that's a really interesting issue that I think every state is talking about. This is just a little plug, okay? There's a group of us, which I think you might be part of, that are meeting to look at whether, because of the perpetrator focus, we should be in the next Anne Rose round and call about perpetrators to try and do a little collaboration into that. <laughs> just thought I'd mention that. <laughs> well positioned. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, I can see somebody right in the middle. <laughs> I've got um, two questions. I just wonder if there's any Aboriginal families that you're looking at in this thing, that, this Patricia project. And also, you were talking at the start about um, when they go out with child protection, someone goes to advocate for the family. Now, that's been happening in the Aboriginal space for a long, long time with VACA or Lakijika. But um, so I just wonder why the statistics for Aboriginals are so high in Victoria for children in out-of-home care. I mean, it's, it's so just, just dealing with the Patricia area, so that one of our criteria around the four files to be looked at was to try and say one of those files should be an Aborig with the, involve an Aboriginal family, so that we're just looking at that. And also the... Um, the big three, the pathways project of the three states, there is looking at whether the trajectory for Aboriginal children through the system, you know, what that is and, and is, are they being treated the same or differently. So there'll be, the pathways project is also analysing that. I think that this issue about why are we not seeing a shift in practice in the numbers of children coming in when we have been, you know, when there's been a development with VACA and Latichika? I think it's a really good question. And it, it may be that things sort of go back to, you know, unless there's sometimes in the enthusiasm of the beginning you get a shift in practice and then how you sustain it so it doesn't all just revert to the norm, I think is probably one of the challenges that we'd be looking at, yeah. Thank you. And I reckon we've got time for one more, and I think there's... Now, where are 
thought I saw oh. Robin Holder with a Christian. <laughs> There's Robin Holder with a Christian up there. Yeah. <clears throat> Want to do Robin? Oh. Yep. Gee, your, your site's way better than mine. <laughs> Thank you, Cathy. Um, you, you paint a picture uh, that's really optimistic in a lot of ways, and I'm going to be the devil's advocate. Um, I, I've known it in one particular jurisdiction that did a lot of these case reviews at a very senior level where there's the combination of child protection, high risk and family and domestic violence that went over a number of years. Um, this is uh, on top of consistent reviews of the child protection system, consistent reorganisations. It's kind of this beast that's been done over, it's been painted and repainted. Tell me why we should be persisting with child protection and why they shouldn't just back out as a system and do what it's designed for. There's a, there's a challenging question, Robin. Bloody hell. So, let me... So, I guess one of the... the actually, here's one of my slides. Hold on a minute. Let me just... The, look, I think... It is why... Look, firstly, I'm an advocate, a very strong advocate for the differential response. I think it's been a disaster for mandatory reporting to put all children living with domestic violence through the... Um, into the statutory system, in the statutory end of the system. Um, and so I do agree with the differential response. You've got to get an awful lot of it out of there because, in fact, they only investigate, you know, between 12 and 20% of what goes in there. So it goes straight in. It goes in and comes straight out. So, you know, how unethical is that? And how did we get ourselves into that, ca into that position? It's just absurd. So I totally agree that all children shouldn't be in the domestic violence arena. Let me just... I do have a slide here that, you know, of the many that I had to cut out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, maybe it's there. Yeah. Okay, so what... The value, though, of child protection is actually there's a group of children that are going to die. There's a group of children that are at significant risk of harm. They should be in the system. They clearly need to be in the system. And what child protection has, it's like, look, it's the, only, it's the only one of our agencies that has the ability to investigate harm to children. They can document the harm, and they can document the harm to, to children, and you've got more chance of it being listened to in different parts of the court system. Everywhere women go, they need evidence. And if they've got no evidence, then it's like it hasn't happened. So documentation of the harm for children, funded, and they're funded to focus on children. Look, there's so many pilots out there within our NGO sector that, in fact, they are funded to focus on children, and that is a value. And we shouldn't sort of underestimate the value of that. There are data, they can be a data repository for tr tracking repeat offenders, and they do have greater leverage and authority with perpetrators. The perpetrators that are referred to men's behaviour change programs <coughs> through child protection they're often the guys that are finishing the program. So that there's some leverage there with perpetrators as well. So it's where there's a lot that you could do when a child protection system works well in the family violence area for children and their mothers living with domestic violence. Um, but I think that the bit that needs to change is the focus on the perpetrator. That's my, my one sharp spear. Thank you very much, Cathy. <laughs> so we are shortly going to break for morning tea, but I wanted to take the opportunity, um, firstly, to thank Cathy Humphreys for a very spirited both presentation and conversation. Can everyone join me again to thank Cathy? It's now my pleasure, before we break for morning tea, to introduce, we've had 
videos from ministers, but I'm delighted to say we actually have a minister with us today, um, the uh, Honourable uh, Minister Zoe Bedison, who is the Minister for the Office of Status of Women, and a number of others. Heather and I were looking at all of the portfolios this morning that she's responsible for. She is, of course, the Minister from South Australia, so a fantastic question about what was going on in the South Australian context. Can I invite um, Minister Bedison up to the stage? Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for your warm welcome. Let me start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting on, the Wurundjeri people of Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and the elders from other communities who may be here today. It's universally accepted that human beings are born equally and endowed with certain rights. Amongst these, are the right to life and the right to safety. Violence against women and their children is the most common violation of we, what we accept to be fundamental human rights. It is the greatest threat to justice, equality and productivity, but it is preventable. Today is a special day for all of us who are committed to the safety and well-being of Australian women and their children. I extend a warm welcome to all distinguished guests and keynote speakers for whom ending violence against women and children is a true passion and focus. I'd like to particularly acknowledge the previous co-chair of the South Australian Premier's Women Council, Professor Anne Edwards, who is now chair of Anne Rose. And I also acknowledge Anne Rose CEO, Heather Nancaro, who has held state and national leadership roles in developing policy to prevent violence against women. Delegates, I'm pleased to join you for the second day of this inaugural annual conference here in Melbourne, particularly as the new Minister for the Status of Women in the South Australian Government. The South Australian Government continues to take strong action to address domestic violence, family violence and sexual assault. We are a proud founding member of Anne Rose, and welcome its national research agenda, which offers reliable evidence to improve practice in preventing and responding to domestic and family violence. It goes without saying that we must do more to respond to the calls of women and children who suffer from violence. And that is why this research agenda is so important. It equips us with the knowledge to make improvements. It encourages us to explore collaborative approaches, particularly in regards to first responder agencies and screening management, in order to end the impunity that allows this crime to continue. It is heartening that violence against women is a priority for governments right across our nation. And it is certainly one of the South Australian government's central focus. And I'd like to acknowledge the ongoing commitment of the South Australian women's sector to this important matter. A right to safety, arts, outlines the South Australian Government's agenda and our commitment to the national plan to reduce violence against women and their children. There are a range of initiatives being undertaken through arts, which includes research and investigation of domestic violence related deaths through the appointment of a senior research officer and the implementation of workplace domestic violence policies in all state government departments. Any public servant experiencing domestic violence now has access to an additional 15 days of special leave with pay in a 12 month period. I would like to see these measures in place across local government, non-government and private sectors. The South Australian Government has also established a multi-agency protection surface, or MAPS as we call it, which brings together staff from police, corrections, education, health, housing SA and families SA in one location to share information in domestic violence and child protection matters. It is a model that has been working well and helps to ensure fewer victims 
fall between the cracks. Our Premier, the Honourable Jay Weatherill, released Taking a Stand, a policy that reiterates the South Australian Government's strong message to the community. That is, domestic violence is unacceptable and will not be tolerated. I'd also briefly mention that our Government's women's policy includes three pillars of action. Improving women's economic status, increasing women's leadership and participation, and improving women's safety and well-being. One of the first initiatives under this policy was achieved late last year with changes to our Residential Tenancies Act. These changes mean that victims of domestic violence will be able to stay at the rented home and have the perpetrator leave or leave the rented premises and be removed for the rental agreement without penalty. We also know that perpetrators of violence are increasingly using technology to facilitate their abuse of women. With this in mind, the South Australian Government created a digital challenge where developers and entrepreneurs competed for funding to design the best high-tech tools to help protect domestic violence victims. This resulted in three innovative prototypes and there is further work away underway in this space. I have a lot more to say, but I hope that this is a brief overview that has provided you with an insight into some of the South Australian Government's strategic and comprehensive approach to violence against women. Anne Rose is critical to this agenda, and that's why I'm here today. As a very new Minister for the Status of Women, I consider the work of Anne Rose incredibly important to facilitate this change that our nation needs. We need to be here, we need to be together, because it is time for us to open the curtains, shine some light and say, moving forward now. And we're moving forward as a nation. Look, I want to say um, a particular thank you to the previous South Australian Minister for the Status Women, Gail Gago, who many of you would have known. I can tell you in the Cabinet room, and in the parliament, she has spoken consistently about women's rights, and I thank her for the work that she's done in South Australia in the past, and I expect that she'll continue to do in the parliament in the future. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. I look forward to speaking to the delegates in the sessions we have ahead. Minister Bettison, thank you very much for that overview of the work that's uh, occurring in South Australia and, and in particular thank you for making time to be here with us. We, we know from your port range of portfolios that you have an incredibly busy schedule and we really appreciate you being here in person. I just wanted to um, also uh, remind people about their mobile app. Uh, we go after morning tea, so we're going to morning tea now, and after morning tea we'll be going to concurrent sessions. So I think that increases the um, opportunity for communication via the, uh, the mobile app, which hopefully you've downloaded. If you're having any problem, let us know and we'll see what we can to do, uh, do to assist. And don't forget that we've got the launch of the uh, Tech Hub uh, by Julie Oberon, uh, the chair of WESNET in the Connaught room at morning tea. So thank you, enjoy your morning tea. <laughs>